Hello everyone, Dynamo here. Just want to ramble about Spider-Man 2 for a moment. I see and hear a lot of stuff from people who are constantly nitpicking on the most trivial things in this game to try and justify something bigger. Most of it don't make sense to me, but I have to admit there are some decent arguments out there that I may incline to agree to a degree. But at the end of the day, do not try and force your negativity on people. You like what you like and don't spread your ill will like a virus, ruining the fun for the rest of us. I also noticed you clicked on this video for the thumbnail instead. This was made by an artist and friend named Drake Powers. If you want to find more of his work, you can check him out on his socials. I'll put in the link in the description box below if you want to look for more black booty, I mean black cat artwork. Alright, back to the topic at hand. Spider-Man 2 is a fantastic, well-crafted game that I thoroughly enjoy from start to finish. I even earned the Platinum Trophy in 100% everything because that's how much I love the game. But is it a perfect game? Not really. But is it a great game? Most definitely yes, and well worth your time. Yet there's still this discourse about the game that makes people lead on one side or the other, which kinda sucks in my opinion because we can never find a good middle ground. My thoughts. On my first playthrough with Spider-Man 2, I'm having a great time swinging through the city, doing all sorts of acrobatic flips and tricks, wall climbing, and hang gliding in each district. I once saw some people who were mad that they cannot take the subway anymore as a means for an alternate mode of transportation. I'm like, dude, you're a superhero with spider powers able to parkour around the city. The whole open world is your playground. Why be normally in a vehicle when you can easily zip around the metropolis? I mean, that is the whole point of being Spider-Man, right? You're fast, strong. Like, what the fuck? The whole point of the superhero genre is to play on that power fantasy. Next, let's talk about the campaign. I'm enjoying the story, it's going at a decent pace. I'm fairly engaged with the plot and character drama. After about 12 hours in, there are story mission components in my opinion that did not sit well with me because they feel like a slog to go through, mainly the ones that are not Spider-Man related. Now I can argue in the previous game, Spider-Man 1, there were some of those too, the Mary Jane stealth missions. I know many of us did not like it, but I can personally forgive them in the first game since they were short, sweet, and to the point they never overstayed their welcome. In contrast to this sequel, there's more of it than ever, if not double the amount of these non-Spider-Man missions, and longer to boot. So the story felt more abrupt and slightly disconnected from the action. Uh, spoiler alert, on the plus side, we finally get to play as Venom. That's when the drive for the story really kicks off, and then it went back to its normal pace just like the first game. I've seen some friends and fans argue about this, and yeah, the game's story itself is fine. But the narrative flow structure seems fragmented due to the more non-related action missions placed in between the main stars of the show, Spider-Peter and Spider-Miles. Then we get to the side content, and I know this one, everybody is 50-50 split decision on it. Look, the game been out for months, and I'm just gonna spoil it, okay? From my experience, I enjoyed a good 60% of the side missions and activities. The other 40% I feel didn't click with me because the payoff wasn't there. In the first Spider-Man game, there was a lot of collecting involved like backpacks and pigeons and a wide variety of different tokens for upgrades and skins. Also, base hunting stealth missions felt almost all the same. Kingpin's thugs, Mr. Negative gangs, and the SS troops. So in part 2, we got two Spider-Men. Some share the same missions and also have their own separate unique ones as well. Though the set number amount of activities are almost exactly the same from the previous one if you compare them back to back. On the surface, it looks like there's a lot more to do, but in reality, their locations are just spread out due to the open world being expanded upon to Queens and Brooklyn. Anyways, back to my thoughts on the side content. The ones that I really enjoyed was the Flame Quest, Mysterium Challenges, Prowler Stashes, and Hunter Bases. I like these missions are more story driven for our heroes because the incentive was there, meaning it led to something bigger for the player or it gave some of the characters along the story closure, a satisfying closure. The next ones are the FNSM request or friendly neighborhood, you know, I'm not gonna say the whole thing. The majority of these type of missions were okay, nothing spectacular. But the ones that made me feel sad yet heartwarming was Finding Grandpa and this other one, Howard. You know, the pigeon man. Whew, man, the ending with Howard left me depressed for a while. And I don't know if I can go through that again on New Game Plus. It was a well done send off for that character. Next, I want to talk about the EMF, Emily May Foundation missions, the science missions for Peter Parker, and Brooklyn Visions for Miles. 
These type of missions really divided the player base by a large margin, mainly because they're mostly puzzle driven and have mini games in them. I get that some people may not enjoy part of this game because they will argue it felt out of place. Though hear me out, and I know some of you may get mad at this, but I think personally it kind of fits within the characters not as their alter ego as Spider-Man but for regular citizens like Peter Parker and Miles Morales. In their defense, a lot of times people tend to forget that Peter is a scientist and Miles is still a high school student, although graduating, and that is the biggest problem that many people tend to forget. You know, as much as I like the Sam Raimi films on Spider-Man about the whole organic webbing thing that naturally shoots out of his wrist, since it was easier to skip the scientific explanation mumbo jumbo, the problem is it spoiled our imagination, meaning it killed the creativity of what Peter can do with his brilliant mind. In a lot of media, they rarely tap into Peter's intelligence, save for the old 1994 animated series. Peter Parker is brilliant, who wants to use his gift for the greater good. So in the game, they show what Peter can do. Heck, they even emphasize it in part 1, early on with Dr. Audio Octavius. As for Miles, remember, the dude is still a kid and the developers choosing to explore his academic background was a good move, especially when they mention he studies music tech, audio, composing, and mixing sound. So for Spider-Man 2, it allowed Miles and Peter to utilize their fields of study into a weapon against the army of Venom's symbiote. Sonic concussion grenades anyone? You realize how useful that tool was? Without their intelligence that hardly anybody ever shines on, we never had this type of weapon to fight the simulate back, I'm just saying. Also, in the developer's defense, Insomniac, some people did not like the puzzles and mini games, but if you're familiar with these developers all the way back in the PlayStation 2 era, Ratchet and Clank, and Spyro, they are highly known for adding puzzles and mini games in all of their stuff. So I knew what was I expecting except for Overstrike. So basically, I saw it coming miles away, and if they didn't put in those puzzles and mini games, then I would not think it's an Insomniac brand at all. This video is about to end, but I want to bring out a second episode of this regarding four characters, Black Cat, MJ, Spider-Gwen, and Haley. Stay tuned for that one, okay? Dynamo signing out.